Um, this is our Lunch and Learn with Jim Gordon. Thanks so much for being here today. If you have any questions, please make sure to type them into the chat box. We will go through those questions periodically. I know you're going to be hearing a lot of legal stuff, so if you have a question, do not um, hesitate to ask. We're here to help answer any questions that you might have. Um, if this is your first Chamber Zoom meeting, we always go over some of the resources that we offer our Chamber members. Um, just, there's just a couple here for you. We have a tab on our homepage at ovidowinterspringsorg that has uh, local, state, and government links for you there. We're also offering a discussion group on Facebook. So if you're a chamber member, that is exclusive for you to reach out to other chamber members, ask any questions you have, raise topics that you'd like to get input on, um, or just share something funny to brighten our day. Um, and then we are offering daily Zoom meetings. Our upcoming meetings that we have tomorrow, we're very excited to have President of the Florida Chamber of Commerce, Mark Wilson, join us. Um, I know this is going to be a hot meeting, especially after the governor's announcements yesterday with reopening Florida. Um, Mark will be able to talk a lot about what's next for businesses. Um, so please join us at 1030 tomorrow. Um, then we're going to go into next week, Monday, May 4th, we're doing a member chat. This is your opportunity to meet with Bridget, ask any questions, go over your chamber benefits. Um, it's also a good time, too, if you are considering membership with the chamber, um, you'll be able to learn everything that the chamber has to offer. That'll be 11 a.m. Monday, May 5th. Tuesday, we are excited to team up with Giving Tuesday now. We're going to do a nonprofit update. This is um, going to be happening all day, but we're going to touch base with touch base with the nonprofits of our chamber at noon. So please join us. And then Wednesday, May 6, we are going to do a meeting with Laura Richardson. Uh, where do we go from here? All of our meetings do have sponsorship opportunities. If you're interested in that, please contact me at a business, business at ovidowintersprings.org. Today's sponsor is UCF. The UCS, UCF Oviedo Winter Springs Incubator has been around since 1999. The UCF Business Incubator Program has been helping startup companies develop into financially stable, high impact, businesses to provide the tools, training, and infrastructure that help facilitate smarter, faster growth. To learn more about pro our program, please visit www.incubator.ucf.edu. Thank you, UCF, for sponsoring today's meeting. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Jim Gordon. Jim is a local attorney here in Oviedo, and he's been a chamber member for over 10 years. He is the managing partner of Beers and Gordon, and we're so thankful to have him join us today to talk a, uh, a little bit about how he can help us and our businesses during this time. So I'm going to uh, pass it over to you, Jim. Thank you so much. Thanks, Melissa. Just getting the, the screen up. Just a second. Yeah, <laughs> as we as we look for it, it was here a minute ago. Uh, I, I, <laughs> it always works this way. Uh, I, I appreciate everyone spending their lunch hour uh, listening to me. I know uh, being an attorney, it's always interesting um, preparing and talking to my wife this morning. Um, she said, you know, you're an attorney, you get way too far in the weeds on things. So I appreciate, I'll, I'll try not to do that. I'll try to keep it um, kind of a macro view of these issues. Um, but I think these are important issues, and I'll go through why I think these are important issues um, and how it's impacted the various businesses. Um, if uh, Melissa mentioned, if you have uh, questions, please put them in the chat, and I'll try to take breaks. Um, as I was explaining to Melissa, I said uh, I'm usually talking in front of juries, and when I do these kind of things, not on a Zoom call, and uh, when I'm talking in front of juries, I get to go for an hour, and no one gets to interrupt me. So uh, I'm going to make sure I, I look for those questions and, and, and look for your questions about these issues. Um, just to give you a brief general overview of what we're going to talk about, it's, I'm going to go through some of the stats on the COVID-19 
um, what, what business interruption coverage is um, and explain what it is and explain what physical loss is, discuss exclusions in the policies and what's called civil authority issues, and then how damages would work and uh, how to work the claim. So you see right on the screen right now, that's, that's my background. Um, I graduated from Notre Dame back in 1992. It's been a long time. Uh, I have a, now have a son going to college next year. Uh, and 1992 was back when Notre Dame was good at football, so that's how long ago it was. And I went to the University of Nebraska, that's where I'm from, for law school back again when Nebraska was good at football. So um, I saw Harry Arthur's on here, big Husker fan as well. Uh, and, and we enjoyed those years. I think two out of three years I was there, we won the national championship. Uh, been a partner. I worked at a defense firm called Zurich International Insurance Company. Um, Zurich is, was the second, might be the third now, uh, biggest property casualty insurer in the world. I did a lot of uh, insurance defense cases, but I also did property cases there, what's called subrogation cases for Zurich. So uh, I was often in meetings with the property department on how to handle these type of claims. It wasn't the focus of the practice um, at, the, at that defense firm, but I certainly have spent many years, 22 years, reviewing insurance contracts. Um, about 10 years ago, I got together, with, 11 years ago almost now, with David Beers, um, and we had Beers and Gordon. And most of the focus of our practices is insurance disputes and, and personal injury cases. And I've just highlighted a couple things um, that I've done in the community as well, and then tried to be pretty involved in the community. The next slide I'm talking about is the, is the outbreaks. And the reason I talk about this is just to give everyone some perspective uh, on what's going on out there right now. So, and one of the perspectives is SARS. So SARS was 2003, there were only 8,000 outbreaks. The reason I bring up SARS is the insurance industry reacted to SARS in 2006, 2007 by putting some exclusions in their policies, looking at the fact that there may be this type of virus or pandemic coming down the road and, and how they could protect themselves. Um, there really has been not a lot of change since 2007 in the way the policies are written. And the reason I bring up the swine flu is you can see 60 million people were estimated to be infected, uh, oddly enough, only 12,000 in the US. So the swine flu really didn't hit us, but there was opportunity in, from 2009 on to, to make any changes to the insurance policies. I think we're all pretty aware of what's going on in our country in terms of uh, the coronavirus and all the different deaths. And uh, luckily in Florida, it's been pretty good the last week or so. It looks like we're gonna be opening up um, in the near future. The business impact, I assume everyone out there, I know we have been impacted and I've talked to a lot of businesses, uh, what their impact is. Um, just looking at some certain things, they're estimated almost a million lot job losses in food and tourism, uh, 736,000 losses in retail. And the National Restaurant Association estimates that $225 billion loss of sales. But locally in Seminole County, I, I listened to uh, Mr. Zembauer, Commissioner Zembauer's presentation the other day, and he said they've already laid off 1,600 employees and lost um, $2.2 million to date. And within Seminole County and just locally, I saw an article, RMC's losing $3 million a day due to the coronavirus. And I've talked to different restaurants, uh, locally that they've lost anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of businesses. So one of the issues is some of the businesses went out and were able to get what's called PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, and originally that was funded with uh, 350 billion dollars and they put another close to 300 billion dollars into the program. But I know a lot of people were shut out of that program, small businesses. Unfortunately some bigger businesses got some of that money and then just timing wise they were unable to get uh, any recovery from the personal, uh, the PPP program. So what that leaves businesses looking at, what's the next potential avenue to pay for these losses? And one of the issues is looking at their own insurance policies, especially restaurants. And a, a lot of law firms, a lot of other places, um, professional services, they have business interruption in their policies. And it will come down to a lot of what the business interruption is and what the policy language says about business interruption. What's interesting is the, the government themselves is pushing for coverage and wanting insurance companies to cover business interruption, even, even if there's exclusions in the policy. So back in March, shortly after all this really started exploding, the House of Representatives, a bipartisan group of House of Representatives wrote to the insurance companies asking them to cover all policyholders for business interruption. 
and they basically said it'll help sustain the businesses through turbulent times, keep their doors open, and retain employees on their payroll. And, and what they probably saw back in March, and certainly what they've seen now, is that despite the biggest stimulus package ever in American history, that that wasn't going to be enough for businesses to continue and go forward. And even though they've given away $650 billion, it all has it's been allocated, it doesn't, hasn't reached every business, but that's not gonna be enough for most of those businesses to continue and to sustain their losses. It may help pay for some payroll, may help pay for some rent and utilities of what, what's the requirements, but it's not gonna pay for all the losses they've incurred. The insurance company's response so far to both the House of Representatives, because it was sent to three different national organizations, was that we don't cover that um, lost revenue, that business interruptions don't cover it. They're saying, hey, paying these claims, A, would bankrupt the insurance companies. And, and, and the reality is that's kind of where insurance companies go. I know there's, I saw a couple of insurance people that I really like on this call or on this, and, uh, but that's, that's kind of where insurance companies first go is, you know, when we have a hurricane, that there's going to be problems and it's going to bankrupt the insurance companies with all the, all the losses in a hurricane. The other claim is, hey, we didn't underwrite for these type of claims. We don't have sufficient funds to cover it. Um, and the policies were not meant to cover a virus or pandemic. And I will explain, there is a, a virus exclusion in some policies um, that you'll need to look at or I'll need to look at as an attorney for you. But th those are the type of things we get into the exact policy language um, that will need to be looked at in real detail about those type of exclusions. But when they're claiming bankruptcy, um, I, I, there's also a push from, from not only said the federal government, but also um, from Donald Trump. He, and I wanna show you guys this video from April 10th of one of his press conferences where he talks about um, this issue involving business interruption. Because I, I think it's important to know um, how the federal government's viewing the way insurance companies uh, are reacting to this. Individuals, families have had to tap their credit cards during this period of time, and businesses have had to draw down their credit lines. Are you concerned, Mr. President, that that may hobble the U.S. economy? All of that debt, number one. And number two, would you suggest to credit card companies to reduce their fees during this time? Well, it's something that we've already suggested we're talking to them. Uh, business interruption insurance. I'd like to see these insurance companies. You know, you have people that have paid when i was in private i had business interruption when my business was interrupted through a hurricane or whatever it may be i would have business where i had it i didn't always have it sometimes i had it sometimes i have a lot of different companies but if i had it i'd expect to be paid you have people i speak mostly to the restaurant tours where they have a restaurant they've been paying for 25 30 35 years business interruption they've never needed it all of a sudden they need it and i'm very good at reading language i did very well in these subjects okay and i don't see the word pandemic mentioned now in some cases it is it's an exclusion but in a lot of cases i don't see it i don't see reference and they don't want to pay up i would like to see the insurance companies pay if they need to pay if it's fair and they know what's fair and i know what's fair i can tell you very quickly but business interruption insurance that's getting a lot of money to a lot of people and they've been paying for years you know sometimes they just started paying but you have people that have never asked for business interruption insurance and they've been paying a lot of money for a lot of years for the privilege of having it and then when they finally need it the insurance company says we're not going to give it we can't let that happen. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. On so I, I think you could see there's a push both by, as we go back to the screen, there's a push by both the federal government, the House of Representatives, and from the president himself to, uh, to look at business interruption. And, and you can even see some of the arguments, interestingly enough, that uh, Donald Trump was making that you're going to hear the attorneys make on this side saying this is why it should be covered and there's going to be push from the federal government I'll get it to it at the very end there's a there's a House of Representative bill basically requiring business interruption coverage you know, notwithstanding exclusions and several states Florida is not one yet but several states have in, in introduced legislation I think there was four more this morning that are going to require business interruption coverage to occur the insurance companies their claim is 
does anyone have any questions so far, Melissa, that I need to cover up through, I think through about a third of it? Let's see if any questions come in yet. If anybody has a question, please feel free to type it in the chat box. And we would like you to ask any questions that you have. This is an opportunity for you to ask one-on-one -on -one questions without sharing too much information, of course. Right. And, and if, obviously, I can't go into detail without reviewing the policies, but I can definitely give some general information. So one of the claims is, well, insurers really go bankrupt. And I looked at this myself as I went through and said, how are the insurance companies doing? And there's, there's uh, this article I found that said right now they have more surplus than any time in their history, over $800 billion in reserves. And I looked at the last reported earnings of some of the larger insurance companies, uh, State Farm, $8.8 .8 billion in 2018, Allstate, $4.8 billion in 2019, Zurich, which is where I worked, $3.72 billion in 2018, which I'll be honest, is, is consistent with when I was there. 10, 15 years ago, $2 billion was about what we, they were earning uh, net income every year at the time. Travelers, Liberty Mutual. Now, not all these, most of these companies give business interruption insurance, especially the, the larger companies, Zurich, Travelers, Liberty, uh, some of the, so, and, and the other thing is, we all look, not only are the companies making money, but I, I look at also, and I know a lot of people, is how much do these CEOs make? The CEOs of of Allstate makes $18 million, CEO of Liberty Mutual makes $17 million. So I think when people look into it, and this is what the House of Reps, and I think it's even what Donald Trump's looking into, is they're seeing these numbers in the billions of dollars of net income the last few years, because insurance has been in a hard market the last few years and saying, you know, you should be covering some of these claims, especially for people that have, the companies that have had this type of policy for years. So basically in, in 2007, uh, the, there was an exclusion entered into a lot of these business interruption policies. I talked about that. It was in relation to the SARS. I, I put ISO and it's a 2007 form. ISO is a, is a company that gives out insurance forms. And the, the purpose of that is to, to, to put everything together and make it as ironclad as possible to allow the insurance companies to use similar type of policy language. And generally what they say for business income is it means net income that would have been earned or incurred and continuing normal operating expenses occurred, including payroll. In most of the policies, and I'm not gonna, it, it says to receive business in, income in, uh, interruption or income coverage, excuse me, there has to be a quote, suspension of operations during a period of restoration, and it must be caused by direct physical loss of use or damage to the property. And then it says the loss or damage must be caused by a covered cause of loss. And in a lot of policies, it will list what a covered cause of loss is. What is going to be the issue in these type of cases is can the business prove that there was a direct physical loss or use or damage to the property? That's going to be one of the biggest claims by the insurance company is was there actually any physical loss or damage to the property? What's interesting, and there's going to be issues whether about suspension and various things like that as well. Now, to be clear for businesses that may be listening right now, suspension isn't Full suspension. Suspension as any insurance policy can be as simple as you weren't like a, a restaurant. I wasn't able, I was able to do takeout, but my business went down 70%. When I did defense work and handled subrogation claims for, for Zurich, I remember we handled a case with a, a law firm and someone hit a transformer downtown and knocked out one of the big law firms for all afternoon or most of the day. So they lost all this billing income back when it was you know, harder to do things on the cloud and on your phones and various things like that. And it, so it wasn't a complete suspension. They were still able to make calls and do various things, but they weren't able to get on their computers. And so they did have a suspension of part of their operations uh, during that time. So really what's going to come down to on this issue is whether proving the presence of the virus on the property or will the concern of the virus presence be enough to prove causation? There, I'm not going to go into cases. Uh, because I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but there are cases, for example, um, where nationwide, there's not specific cases in Florida on these issues. Uh, but one of the cases was back in Oregon and said smoke from local wildfires constituted a physical loss to that building. So the building itself was not damaged by the fire, but it was unusable essentially because of the concern of smoke in the area and getting into that building which would be one of the arguments you'd be making here is that there's loss to that use of that building 
because there was either COVID on there or concern there would be COVID on the property. Um, some case also says that physical damage is not necessarily where it's been rendered unfit for occupancy. So it's basically like contamination cases. There's cases out there where oil got underneath a, a business, gas and oil, and the fire department came in and said, you can't use that building because the concern of what's the soil that's been contaminated underneath the building. There is, in a lot of policies, and this is what I talked about from SARS and that's in that ISO policy, is there's a virus exclusion. It says, we will not pay for loss or damage caused by or resulting from any virus, bacterium, or other microorganism that can induce physical distress, illness, or disease. That virus exclusion needs to be looked at very carefully, number one. Number two, it needs to be looked at to see if there is a virus exclusion in the policy. Not all the policies have virus exclusions. There are policies, I'll use an example. Wimbledon had a policy that did not require, a, a, they did not have a virus exclusion. They had a pandemic policy actually through Lloyd's of London. So the fact that Wimbledon's not gonna occur in 2020, they're getting covered for all of that because there wasn't an exclusion, they had some other coverages in there. And that's why it's so important to look at the actual policy language and have an attorney look at the actual policy language to see if there would be a case and if there would be an exclusion. The other question is, and going in, is the virus causing damage to the property? We don't know, it changes every day. I think we've seen this every day. The, the numbers change, the, what, what is gonna cause the virus to go away, what is not gonna cause the virus to go away, how long it's around. But they say it sits 24 hours on cardboard, two to three days on plastic, two to three days on stainless steel. And the question's gonna be for a lot of businesses when they're arguing about these issues, and it'll come down to a lot of times a determination by the judge is there enough to go forward? Is there what's called a question of fact? So anytime there's an issue before a court, one side, and when I did defense work, one side will say, hey, we don't want it to go beyond the judge. Judge dismiss this case because this law or this policy or this contract says you can't go forward. If there's any ambiguity in the contract or is there any ambiguity in the facts, the judge has to say that goes to the trier of fact, which in most cases would be, would be the jury. And one of the issues uh, whether the virus is causing damage to property is proving that it was on the property, but it's also going to be hard to prove it was never on the property, especially when they're saying there might be as much as 80 to 85 percent of the population that at some point had coronavirus, that to say that it was never on the property back in February or March is going to be hard uh, for them to say. I think what insurers, they've kind of claimed already that there's been about eight or nine lawsuits filed. I have not seen if any of them have filed in Florida as of yet. I know some have been filed in Texas and California. There was one filed in San Diego and Houston just yesterday. Um, but their claim so far is there's no physical damage to property. And also there's no prohibition of access to the property, which goes into another part of this issue. Did the virus cause you to lose business income or did the, the actual civil authority order, in this case, coming down in Florida from uh, Governor DeSantis, did that cause the issue? So going, I know I've been going for a little while. And Melissa, are there any questions that I need to cover? So we had a couple that I think you did answer. Um, we had one question, will these be class action suits or individuals? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I'll cover that now. So there are law firms looking at these as class actions. We are not one of them. Um, the reason is, there, there's two reasons. We, we don't really get involved in class action lawsuits, number one. But number two, I know there's a couple of attorneys on here. Most of the people, we've all, we've all gotten a letter from, or a notice from a phone company or something saying there's a class action and if you join the class, you may get some money. And we all end up getting, if we say yes, we all end up getting a check for $1.50 or $25 and you, you wonder why, that, why it was worth it. The problem with class actions is a lot of times, sometimes it has to be that way. And I, I don't know if the courts will eventually say, hey, all these have to be bundled together and they have, you know, if it's all against Liberty Mutual, they have to be bundled together against Liberty Mutual and they're required to be a class. That would be, if that happens, then that'll, that'll be what happens. But it's always better if you can avoid to be part of the class because when you're part of the class, the, the people that, that win on that are not the individuals as much as the attorneys. 
because they have class and they, they can negotiate the class out and say, well, we got 50 cents on the dollar, but they can still get their fees and they get approval from the court. It's always better for the individual. We were involved in a case, um, a personal injury type case against a, on a product's liability case where the, the product was put out in the, in the industry knowing that, that there was a problem with it. It was a medical device and they had to be part of the class. And I will tell you that settlement that they gave, everyone got the same settlement essentially, was a third to probably 10% of what she would have gotten if she could have pursued it on her own. And basically she, it came down to a choice. Um, the settlement was 90% have to participate in this class action um, settlement. If they don't, then everyone has to go out on their own, which could take years. And that's the, the benefit to all parties is it doesn't take years. But the other, the other thing was uh, you, you're going to be stuck waiting for four or five years and they're going to fight you on this issue. Do you want some now or, or later? So the, I know that's a long winded answer, which is typical of us attorneys, but I, I think if we can avoid, I know we'll try to avoid ever getting into a class action because it's, it's always more beneficial for the owner of the business to be out of the class action. Was there any other question? Yeah. Jim, so, so going back to the physical damage argument, mm -hmm. um, this is from Corey. Do you believe you will run into a waiting period issue, usually 72 hours, if it's shown virus lives less than 72 hours on a surface? Yeah, that's a good question in there because there's, there's an issue about how long it's been on the surface. It's going to be, the reality is it's going to be difficult for, for plaintiffs and defendants to prove when it was on the property and how long it was on the property. Because, you know, 72 hours, if you say it was on, on plastic inside, it could be two to three days, it could have been more than 72 hours. And it, it, there's gonna probably be experts that are gonna need to be hired on both sides. And right now, the experts, there's such a difference in opinion on that, on how long it's staying on surfaces. I've seen other issues or other things saying it's staying on surfaces, you know, longer than, than 72 hours, depending on the type of surface. Um, keyboards and, and various things, but they're telling you to clean them off more than you do. So um, it certainly is going to be an issue, but that goes back um, with that question, that goes back to an issue of fact. So will the judge be able to say, hey, I as the judge rule that it was not on the surface within 72 hours. I, I don't think a judge is going to be able to rule on that without, basically it's going to come down to one expert saying it, it could have been and the other expert saying that there's no way it was, which usually is the way that happens. I don't know if that answered the question. If they have further, if they have further questions, maybe I can cover it later. Were there any other questions? Um, I just want to mention that the latest um, article I saw talked about shoes and how long that they stayed on shoes and how far the virus tracked, which I'm sure could be a factor there. Yeah, oh, that's a huge issue. Um, uh, Marcy, my wife, is on the board at Oviedo Medical Center. She was on a call she's on a call every week with them since it started but maybe three weeks ago she she got off the call and her first thing was stop wearing your shoes the biggest thing they're, they're figuring out and they were figuring out the hospitals is that it's coming in on everyone's shoes and it's, then it's getting on the surface everywhere and, and we're, we were pretty relaxed about you know people coming in our house before this we don't have anyone coming in now but they'd say do i need to take off my shoes we're like no big deal let's not worry about it ever since then all our shoes are out in the garage so that's the hardest part right now is there's it's changing every day and um, you, I think sometimes the people that are hearing it first are like the hospitals and other other individuals maybe even the government um, yeah. obviously before we are so I think this is more of a comment and there's a lot of acronyms in here you probably know what they are I do not <laughs> Um, it's talking about the trigger for the physical damage is that it's from Harry Arthur he says that is the trigger point BI slash EE has to have the property damage to trigger the coverage. Second thing is if the paid out BI slash EE, then the BI EE coverage as ALS <laughs> would be gone forever, especially on BOPs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what all those acronyms mean. I'm I sorry know. if I read it oh, wrong. <laughs> all right. I, I, I know most of them. Um, I think Harry's quite, or Harry's making a comment more than a question and, yeah. it, and it's going to, and I figure Harry may have a, a difference in opinion on how this will work, um, being on the insurance side, but there is going to be a, an issue about, um, about how long, like we, you asked, when did it start? How long did it start? But you also get into, 
um, the civil authority issue, which is what I was just starting to talk about, and the, the lack of access to your property um, during that physical authority, their civil authority, and you know, is there physical loss? It's, it, it goes to some of those cases that I was mentioning, and I just mentioned a couple. Is just because the, the building, like the smoke, it didn't damage the building, but the, but it caused an issue in the building and made it rendered it unusable. And that's what the argument is going to be, I believe, is that these buildings are, have been rendered unusable. And actually, what's interesting too, based even on that question, is like in Broward County, the, the order that came out for Broward County said the coronavirus is causing physical damage to property. And actually, the New York order that came out in March said the exact same thing. Now, the order from DeSant uh, Governor DeSantis did not say that, but there was an admission, even by the government authorities at the time, that it was causing damages. Phys and they, they said physical damage to the property. And I, I agree with Harry, it's going to be an issue, but I also believe strongly that it'll be an issue that won't be one that the judge can kick out the case. I think it'll be an issue where the judge will have to look at the various things and say, this has to go to a trier of fact. And whether the trier of fact is the judge, if it's a, jury, a judge bench trial, or if it's, a, if it's a, a jury trial. So, you know, as we sit here today to know, when there's been a handful of cases filed nationally, how all of this is gonna come down, I, I don't know. And I think we're gonna have difference in opinions between the insurance side and definitely um, the victim, the, the business side of the law and how these things are gonna be interpreted. Absolutely. Corey commented that BIEE -E is been business interruption with extra expense. Right. And then um, Harry then said, how about liability issue if people get kind of contaminated with virus when they return to work? Are, are we talking about that today? Well, I wasn't, but that's, that's, that's going to be an interesting issue. And uh, I don't think that's going to be covered by, you know, your, your business policy per se. Um, but um, that's going to be an interesting issue. I, and I think the question may be like, if you go to a restaurant and I'm interpreting Harry's question here. Um, if you go to a restaurant and you're exposed, the hard part's going to be, and I've had a couple people reach out to me and say, hey, can, can, will there be a claim if I prove I was exposed to the coronavirus? The hard part's going to be proven that you were exposed at that place. And that's where I think in, when you're talking about an injury, like getting coronavirus, and, and that would lead to medical expenses and it may lead, they don't know a lot of people have had it. I've had a couple of friends that have had it, not locally, but um, one of my good friends from college, he's a doctor, had it up in Chicago. They don't know what the long-term uh, implications are, meaning it affect your lungs long-term. So in theory, if you got it, you can claim I had medical expenses, I had deductibles, I had this and that. The hardest part for any attorney on that side for the victim is gonna be proving what's called causation. What caused you to get the coronavirus because you, you know it, unless you never left your house during a certain period you know for 14 days and you went to one place during those 14 days um, and you can say that and then they know there was a outbreak at that restaurant and th that might give you a chance to claim that but I think even then if your kids went out or your spouse went out or anyone else came into your house like you said, it could come in on shoes, it could come in on, you know, through someone touching a doorknob. Proving causation on those type of injury cases, I think is going to be really, really, really hard. And that's the, the two inquiries I got on that. That's basically how I left it with them, as I said. I, I don't think you're ever going to be able to prove where it came from. Okay, that's all the questions and comments for now. Okay. No, I, and I appreciate all the, the questions and comments, and uh, I appreciate the, the questions by uh, insurance, because I think there's, it's interesting to have uh, Harry and other people involved that, that see both, you know, see it from both sides. And I, I admittedly see it from both sides too, because I've done both sides. I did you know, insurance for 10 years and this side for 10 years. Um, the civil authority is, there's, there's some coverage in various policies for what's called the action of civil authority. And it's basically when you're prohibited by the civil authority uh, from using that property. And I don't want to get too far into it. We've talked about Governor DeSantis's order. Um, there are a couple different orders. 20, 2091 is the one that basically clarified everything and said all non-essential businesses will be closed until April 30th. You know, the non-essential businesses would have an argument if they have 
viable business interruption coverage, if they were not able to do anything remotely for you know full loss for whatever that period of time is. The other businesses that could or should have been open, and when I say that, um, insurance companies know and insurance uh, individuals like Harry know, uh, Harry Arthur know, you, companies have a duty to what's called mitigate their damages. So let's say you're a restaurant and you could have done takeout or you could have done uh, delivery and you chose not to. There is an argument that the insurance companies will make and that they, they will be allowed to make that, hey, you should have mitigated your damages. You should have been open to make you know, even 20% back or 30% back. And if, if you fail to do that, you, you know, if you shut down completely, but you have the opportunity to do something, you will probably be limited on the amount of damage you, you can claim on that type of thing. Um, I'm gonna skip extended business income requirements because I think uh, I've gone for a little while and I don't wanna get too far in the weeds. Um, there, there's, there was a question about, you know, what coverage for business income began 72 hours um, after the first action of the civil authority that prohibits access to the premises. Um, and then there's coverage that continues for four consecutive weeks after the date of the civil authority or when the civil authority coverage ends, whichever is later, depends on the policy. That was kind of covered by one of the comments uh, by one of the, the questions in there. Uh, possible expense, possible damages, and you heard uh, EE, extra expenses. Extra expenses can be a lot of different things. I gave a couple examples. One would be advertising to resume your business would arguably be an expense where you could say I had to advertise to get back business to come in to let everyone know I'm a restaurant, I'm open, uh, I'm ready for business. There can be costs of securing your property. You know, some businesses didn't have, uh, let's say, video capability and they knew their restaurant they announced they're going to be down for, for 30 days or as long as, as, as the, the non-essential businesses were in place. Then that they could argue that that was cost of securing the property. We've talked about a loss of income that's going to come mostly from the business itself through their accountant, and then potentially um, there's a question of what's called remediation of the property. So there's going to be businesses when they when they reopen, they're going to have to clean and disinfect the property. And what's going to be interesting, I think, is especially with the restaurants, is how much more expense they're going to incur. I used to represent when I did defense work. Um, Zurich had a lot of restaurants that they represented. And so I knew um, after work, you know, for example, an ale house after work, usually they bring an outside company that comes in and cleans everything from midnight or whenever they close until six in the morning. They, they wipe everything down, they do everything. Well, they're gonna have to do that in a different way than they were doing it before. And it's probably gonna be more expensive to do than before. And there, there might be even more expense in terms of, are, are some of the businesses like a restaurant, are they gonna go to disposable, uh, utensils or various things like that because of concern of people have about cleaning and disinfecting. So there's gonna be extra expenses they can look at when you're looking at the possible damages. Uh, if you're gonna make a claim, what you need to provide your attorney is that business insurance policy. That governs what can, can or cannot happen if you have, because some people didn't purchase business interruption coverage. You heard uh, the president say he always purchased it, but not in every, or he said, I always purchase it, I think is what he said. And then he said, not in every instance that I did, but most of the time I did. So you got to look to see if you ever purchased it because it's something you have to uh, go out and get. And some companies don't do it. So that's, that's a big part to see if you even have that coverage. And then number two is whether there's exclusions in the policy and what are the covered claims, covered perils listed in your policy. If you don't have that, you have a good insurance agent, commercial agent like Mr. Arthur or you, or you can get it through them or you can go directly to your insurance company and get it through them. Um, they have to give you a copy of your policy if you request it. The, the other thing we would need would be your income summary for the last 12 months. I know I can pull that through my office manager through QuickBooks or I can acquire it from my accountant. And so that would be interesting. And also if you, if you have a different trend, um, like your business is building. I know there's a lot of businesses out in Oviedo that have opened in the last two or three years. So they've seen a building of businesses or building of their business. And every month they're going up, you know, anywhere from 3% to 10%. And if they could show that, that it went down. So maybe April of 2019 wouldn't be truly equivalent to April of 2020 because the business has been building. And then you'd have to give a summary of your lost income during the lockdown. And that's going to be directly from the business owner. Again, the policy is important. It drives what's going to uh, be involved in when the timeframes are making these claims. 
Um, there may be an appraisal requirement regarding the loss. Um, as I talked about earlier, there may be a requirement to mitigate the damages. And the reality is if, if they haven't mitigated already and they're 30 days into it, there, there's going to be that argument against that business for failing to do that. And there's nothing you can go back and do beyond that. You just got to go forward from that point forward. Um, there is, Florida still has what's called bad faith. And bad faith is basically if, if it could ever be proven. And it's, it, it doesn't happen very often. The reality is it doesn't happen very often. Um, but if it could be ever proven that an insurance company acted basically with gross negligence. And that's kind of the, the, the realm they look at it as. And they call it what's quote, they acted in bad faith. What a civil remedy notice has to be filed with the Department of Financial Services has to be done before you can even go down that route. Um, and and the, the insurer gets 60 days to what they call cure the deficiency. And that could be paying the claim, that could be paying part of the claim or various things like that. So there are timeframes involved with handling any type of insurance claim. A lot of times, like I said, the policy language drives it. They're just generally speaking, uh, contractual claims in Florida have a five-year statute of limitations, but you wouldn't want to wait five years because there may be an exclusion in your policy on a time frame. Likely not, but there might be. And more importantly, you might get stuck in a, if you wait, you might get stuck in a class action that you might not want to be involved in. Like I said earlier, the federal government pushed back in March to have businesses cover the, or insurance companies cover business interruption. Um, there was a, there's a draft of a house bill that I saw recently that they basically, same type of thing, they want the policies to cover any viral pandemic, any forced closure of business due to the federal government or local and state governments. That bill is still in the draft stage. It um, has not made it out of committee yet. I don't know if it'll go forward, but there is a, you can see by the first House of Representatives, you can see by what President Trump said, and you can see by this House of Rep bill that there is a push from the federal government to get as much coverage available to uh, property owners as possible business owners because the federal government basically, I think is getting to the point they're gonna be tapped out. So that's what I have for my presentation. Um, I wanna ask if anyone has any further questions or, or comments that they wanna add, I'm happy to, to give those today. And if, and I, I'll turn over to you in one second. If, if you don't feel like asking the question, you know, here, because it might pertain to your business, I'm happy to, to have a phone conference with you, Zoom, whatever you want to do, um, to go over those things. Like I said, it, it boils down a lot to the policy itself. So it's, it's hard sometimes to answer questions about specifics without reviewing the policy. Um, you're just questions? getting a lot of praise right now. Great job, Jim. <laughs> I, want to I, give full I appreciate that. This is not, I, I prefer to be standing in front of someone rather than by Zoom, so. I understand. It's a different, it's a different meeting like this for sure. Any questions? Now's your time. We have a few minutes left. Oh, we have a question from Chris. I know there's talk about liability protection and other relief packages out of D.C., Will that actually protect businesses or be lip service? <laughs> Chris, is a, I assume that's Chris Celio that's asking the question. Because <laughs> you called him Chris, so I assume that's your husband. So um, that's going to be tough for them to, to, to exclude liability for a business going, going back. and Because really, it... The, the, here's what's going to be the problem is that's covered by state law, not by federal law. So most cases involving an injury are, are, are state cases, they're negligence cases. And if you sue any business that's, that's in Florida, they're going to, you, you have to sue them in the state court. So it doesn't become a federal question. So for the federal government, they would have to get agreement from the states to supersede the state laws. Now they could overwrite federal laws, and say, hey, anytime it involves a, a federal company, but the reality is restaurants and you know, salons and various places are gonna be you know, locally owned. And unless, they, unless the, court, the local courts of the states wanna adopt that federal guidance, I think you're probably right by your implication, which it probably will be more lip service than actual, it'll be a feel good, we'll, we'll help you out, but the reality is um, it will be hard to help them out. But, Saying that, like I said earlier, that causation gap 
between proving where the person contacted uh, COVID unless something changes on what we know about it. But the causation gap right now would be so difficult that you know, those, I can't see those cases having much uh, ability to move forward. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, thank you, Jim. Please thank feel free to reach out to Jim. His information's in front of you if you have any other questions. And, and I really appreciate everyone spending their lunch hour. I appreciate all the questions. That helps, helps me to focus my uh, answers back. I appreciate the comments and the questions about the insurance issues as well. And I hope everyone's safe and doing well. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.